I have, I would say, a lot of resentment against the whole world about it. Not any one person, but I feel like I paid a huge motherhood penalty. I, you know, I paid a huge price for being a stay-at-home mom, and for many complicated reasons, I could not re-enter the workforce. Hello, Namaste, Auntie Zarna here. So excited to have you for the Zarna Garg Family Podcast Show. We have a full house. All five Gargs are in today. We have my daughter, who is a junior in college, Zoya. We have my son, who is a senior in high school, Bridge. We have my 12-year-old middle schooler, Veer, and my husband of 25 years, Shalab Garg, who is a finance professional. I hope you're going to enjoy today's episode. It is a very complicated and sensitive episode. We were nervous about filming it. We are nervous about filming it, but we're doing it in the spirit of involving everybody in the community and getting a conversation started around a topic that we traditionally don't talk about. So please, I hope you enjoy what we're doing. Like, like subscribe, follow, engage with us. We're always wanting to hear more. And today's topic is, are you ready for this? What happens when the father, when the main breadwinner of a brown household loses his job and our livelihood is threatened for the first time in 20-something years. We, the Garg family, just went through this big pre period of transition. It was a very complicated and difficult period, and we are going to share our experience with you and hope that you guys talk to your own family members about your experiences. So, Shala, you went through this transition recently, as did our whole family, 20-something years of building a career, and you had reached an inflection point where you had to leave a job that you had built for yourself for all these years, and you decided to start your own thing. Please walk us down that journey and tell us what happened. You're right. So in, uh, this is just before COVID, a year before COVID, and um, you know I was managing a fund which saw redemptions on the, on the back of a bad year. Um, I had always been looking forward to starting something of my own. Uh, it was a tough decision at the time to either stay and, and rebuild um, that business that I had built over 10 plus years at that point, actually more, uh, or to start something of my own. And I took a shot and started something of my own. So that was sort of the lead in uh, to what you just described um, of a few tough years, not immediately thereafter, but a couple of years after that. So just to understand, when you were making the decision, when you found out that you had these redemptions, redemptions means investors are choosing to walk away from your fund, which means your fund is shrinking and you might not make enough management fees or enough um, money incentives. as... I'm sorry, what is it called? Management and incentive. So you get 2%. And incentive fees. You're not making enough fees to sustain your life and your livelihood. When you were face going down that path of like looking like more and more, you're going to have to leave something you knew for 20 something years. How was that for you? Were you excited? Were you scared? Were you nervous? It was a mix of emotions. You know, so, you know, I would say that I was nervous about the possibility of doing something of my own, the fear of the unknown, as you may call it. I was confident of my skill, right? Because I had done it. Um, it is ultimately a talent business. And I felt that, you know, job or no job, the talent is there, right? So I can monetize that talent in 10 ways, 10 different ways. And uh, and I was, you know, a little sad to be leaving the people I worked with and I managed uh, for all these years. I had a big team of, uh, there were almost nine people that reported directed in, uh, directly into me. And I knew that my leaving would threaten their jobs because um, they would not, they would have to find other things. There was the firm may be able to find some spots for a few people, but it did ultimately turn out that they all had to leave as well. Right. And the thought of starting your own thing, were you nervous about that or were you excited? What was your, uh, what, what were your feelings about that at that moment that you're going to start your own thing? I, I was very scared, you know, because, you know, the way the country is set up, our beautiful country of ours is that, and this is something I had not thought about you know, you would laugh at me being a 48-year-old man that the first time I thought about it was at 45, that you can't get health insurance as a company of one, right? right? There is this stupid Obamacare that exists. I shouldn't use the word stupid. I apologize for that. But there is this Obamacare that exists, but none of the doctors or hospitals in New York accept it. So what is the point of it, of buying it off the exchange, even if you're willing to pay it out of pocket, right? So I'm just bringing it up as a very 
minor point that all of a sudden I have a family of five and I have all the money in the world. It's not like we were short on money, but I just wanted to get health insurance and willing to pay for that insurance out of pocket on a monthly basis. But there is no way to do that. You have to be as a small business, at least a company of two for to qualify for the small business health insurance program from, you know, variety of different vendors. Ultimately, we I did end up hiring uh, other people and was able to get health insurance as a result of it. But this realization of a few months that we just have to pay for any health issue out of pocket, uh, we could afford it, so it's fine. But it was pretty scary. And I bring this up as partly an answer to your question of how it felt. So when facing with all these random things, because I just thought when I left, I'm just going to start and start managing assets and start doing what I was doing. And the world will see the talent and the talent will sparkle and that'll be the end of it. But in reality, it turned out to be quite different where, you know, the nitty gritty of the shitty is very shitty. <laughs> <laughs> he he has stolen my saying and he also I've butchered never it. Heard you say that. How is this? I've never heard you say that. The, no, oh my God, Shalab, tell them. Shalab, I'm not gonna. I, Shalab, I claim it. I'm are you claiming serious? It. I'm claiming Do you it. have any shame? <laughs> The, the, first of all, you butchered it. That's not even the saying. What I've been saying for years, the nitty gritty is shitty. Oh. <laughs> People, when they say and focus on the nitty gritty, I, I, when we go on our walk, I, I tell you. I think mine was then nicer anyway. Nitty gritty of the shitty is shitty. <laughs> what are you talking about? Of what? Okay, anyway, this was, okay. All right. He, so that's he part of the answer. With, the second part of the answer is the excitement part, which was very exciting too, because for the first time, you know, I didn't have, I mean, I for the most part, the last 10 years of my job, I didn't have a direct boss because I had the top job. So that meant that my boss was my clients, people I'm managing, was managing mm -hmm. money for, which are important bosses as well, because, you know, each one of them requires management on the upside. But I didn't have a traditional operational boss because I had the uh, the C-suite position. But the even so, the all of a sudden now I was just entirely uh, on my own time and doing my own thing. And uh, so that part was exciting too. And, uh, you know, even though things like health and other things are very tough, uh, toughly laid out for an entrepreneur starting a new business, there are other things that are very well laid out in the country of ours as well for an entrepreneur. For example, starting a LLC or creating a new firm and all of that is a one day affair, opening a bank account. And these are things I'd never done before as a firm. And I was very pleasantly surprised to see how easy and, uh, you know, trivial those things are and how easily you can be up and running um, with respect to uh, starting a business. Okay, Were you? So, yeah, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Were you worried about what me, Bridge and Veer, obviously you and mom had your own conversations, but the way that the three of us found out was we all found out together um, when we were eating dinner. And uh, I know that I've talked to Bridge and Veer a lot about this moment, but it was a big conversation that we had all at once. And I'm curious when you shared the news with us, were you nervous about how we were going to take it? No, I had confidence in the kids. I mean, in fact, you know, Zarna was, as always she is, 100% supportive every step of the way, right? She, in fact, wanted this for me for the longest time because she thought that I'm giving my talent away, you know, to a big employer as from previous podcasts, everybody knows that she's very supportive of anybody starting something of their own. So I was not nervous. And remember, I have to say that income over the years had been very good. So we had at that time uh, plenty of uh, money that I wasn't worried about immediate liquidity or things of that nature either. So, you know, the nervousness was more from um, the uncertainty of starting a new business, but not from any other place. So just to uh, clarify, before Zoya spoke to Bridge and Veer extensively, I spoke to Bridge and Veer extensively. No, you didn't. And we, yes, we did. Bri what? Veer, yes, we did. Yes, we what are you, did. About what? As a family, I explained to you that there are complicated circumstances coming up because even though your dad thought we had a lot of money in the bank, I knew that when your running income stops coming in, the money in the bank starts going very fast. The money that looks like a lot, it, it just starts bleeding. And I, I kind of knew that I had to prepare some sort of defensive strategies. And Veer Bridge, back me up here, you, me, and Veer, spoke quite extensively about this before Zoya and you guys spoke. 
No, right? We definitely did. We not not before me and Didi spoke. Like we all spoke together. We all spoke at but the same was, time. But that was Didi was a part of that conversation. That was, yeah. d- yeah. I don't know Rich, why you're I getting competitive why. about the timeline of yeah. the conversation. I mean, I because you said you and Bridge and Veer spoke as if I didn't speak to all of you guys, and I did. <laughs> She's getting her. Why are you so petty? <laughs> you are okay. the pettiest person. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so now you were excited, Shalab, when you were like, "Okay, I'm gonna do my own thing. This is a. This is not what I." thought first of all you didn't think you were going to be in this position were you did you it you're right it was partly circumstances because of the redemptions that you described so it wasn't like a year before i made this decision i had been planning for multiple years that the next step for me is to start something mm-hmm. on my own so in that sense you're right but for example i had other options at the time um despite the redemptions to not start something on my own and just jo- join another fund, right? That option did exist. Uh, and I chose not to do that. So it was, uh, what you're saying is uh, half correct, but half uh, incorrect. Okay. So now you go down this path of setting up your own business. And first of all, you're leaning on your family savings to carry you through, right? Through the time while you're still setting things up. And what was that experience like with a family of five? You were at the time the only breadwinner. I had just started working in comedy. I was making $25 a set if I was lucky. Just so people know, I didn't make money in comedy for years before I actually made any money. I was losing money in comedy. In fact, I would get a $25 paycheck, but I had spent, I don't know how many dollars going, coming in my outfitting, having to pay a camera guy, having to pay a videographer. So you were actually, Shalab, we were not only bleeding money in our living, but we were bleeding money in my business because there was just no money coming in for a long time. You're right. So, you know, it is true that unfortunately, or I don't know how to describe it, but I never lived financially a very responsible life, which is very atypical of an Indian man. Most Indian men are not like me. Most Indian men actually live financially very responsible. They save nine of the 10 that they make and spend one. And in fact, you know, there are stories written about how uh, an Indian man looks like so poor, but if you look at his bank account, he's really rich and things of that nature. I mean, I, I did not live like that way. I, I, used, I used to love spending money and live large. And, um, you know, we, you and I together landed up in a Connecticut town and bought a house one from one day to another as as just a summer home. And so I mean, my point is that, and I'm not blaming you for any of it because I, I was definitely more financially irresponsible uh, for the two of us. But, but what we made the decisions me, together. We did. So just for the context of this video, this is not a fight between Shalab and me. I also like to live well. We jointly made the decision to live in Manhattan, which is the most expensive city where you can raise kids. So the, we don't have any disagreement on it's your fault or my fault. We we have many disagreements and they're going to come up, but that's not one of them. <laughs> Understood, right. Uh, but even after all of that, I was, you know, uh, as you pointed out, as there was no quote-unquote paycheck, uh, as it always was, all of a sudden money does fly very quickly, you know, because um, it is the city of New York and um, three kids, one of which was about to start college, uh, within a within several months or a year of it, um, other two growing but growing boys with activities and this and that, um, and as you pointed out, you had not yet started to earn money. But I got to tell you, not for a second at that time, money was not even the top three of my mind. It was not. You know, it was not because I was just, I mean, I was just very arrogant in my talent and my capability, and um, I wish. So what was on your mind? Huh? What I was, was on your mind? I was just, just really just counting in my head how many t- days it will be before, you know, I'm even wealthier than I left my last job at. And when those days turned into weeks and those weeks turned into months and ultimately the months turned into over a year or even a couple of years, it's only then that I first started to uh, realize that, oh my God, this is, this may not be what I had thought <laughs> and you know uh, and that you know <laughs> why are you guys laughing because the phone is <laughs> no. ringing it's okay I mean we're no. like this people is the reality of shooting a podcast with a family <laughs> of five spread apart and this is such a serious thing that Shalab is saying and I wish yeah. we had not been interrupted be- 
Okay, it's okay. You, just continue. I, we can go back to that if you want. It's just no, continue. No. Just continue. No, just continue. Okay, so you know, as I said, when the days turn into weeks and weeks into months and months into years, and clients that I had managed money for wanted to see a um, couple of years of performance on some capital before committing or. You know, it just sort of started to Hold become... Hold on, so explain that to the kids. The clients that actually were considering putting money in your new venture said to you what? They did not want to bear the expenses of a startup. So their position was that, you know, we don't want to be the first investor, get some money, yeah. either your own or otherwise, which is, I did do that. I put my own money in it and, um, you know, raise some performance, have a couple of good years uh, and then come back to us. So even when you think, just so you guys know, as an entrepreneur, even when you think you have everything, you don't understand. Sometimes the journey is so long that it's like every time you 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 think you're there, it's like, no, but we need to see proof of one more thing. Right. In his case, yeah. there were a lot of people that it's actually had worked with him for a long time. But every time he thought he was closing a new deal, it was, like, oh, no, wait, but we need this. Or, oh, no, our company right now is not investing in this or our whatever. You know, do you guys understand? I mean, what to I'm be saying? fair, COVID did hurt because that was a year that just got wasted, right? 2020 and um, half of 2021 where things just completely shut down. But to be fair, 2020, people were definitely doing transacting business on Zoom and online. So in hindsight, when I look back at it, I do feel like it's more an excuse than reality because 2020 was a booming business year in finance, even if it wasn't a booming travel or a booming, um, uh, you know, uh, recreational year. Okay, so how was it knowing that you had to come home to me and us and the kids and be like, I just don't know when I'm going to have money coming into the bank anymore. When did Honestly, that occur again, to you? That, that also did not occur to me for a fairly long time because, you know, every time it felt like, um, uh, you know, I, I always had the mindset that, you know, whatever I touch turns into something good based on the past, right? High school went into IIT, IIT went into Columbia, Columbia went into a big bank, a big bank went into a, into a, a fund, fund went into a, a C-suite job. So it just, the, the feeling was so new that it never really occurred to me that a conversation needs to be had on this topic. And um, I have to say that your guy's mother, you did a much better job of preempting all of that than I ever did because I just feel like I was in a la-la land. In the sense that I, um, you know, I, I actually, looking back, I don't know what I was thinking. I just assumed that just like every time things have worked out, this time things will work out just perfectly as well. You know, and, 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 the, and, the, and the image on the Wall Street Journal is just two days away off. Okay, <laughs> but at what point did it hit you that it's not going to work out like that? Maybe a couple of years ago, 2022. Uh, 2022 and early part of 2023. Okay, uh, so when, when that hit you, this. when that hit you, what were your feelings then? And and talk about that. So when that hit me, I considered other options. I thought that oh, I can always just go back find employment. But you know, with gap of having started something of my own and becoming older along the way, um, another realization hit for the first time that I'm not as attractive an employee as I am an attractive a CIO or a business owner. Because to explain to someone that, you know, I have all this talent, it's sort of like, you know, Tom Cruise at his age can produce fantastic films as a hero, but there are a hundred other probably men his age who were good heroes 20 years ago, but since the last 20 years have not been able to find work, right? Because they've just not been able to keep up with the, uh, so it's not that dissimilar to it that, you know, even though <clears throat> age for men works differently than age for women in the sense that, um, uh, what? No, we actually, what? we all age equally. Wait, dad, what is an ACIO? Not an ACIO, A, A, and A as, a, uh, as an alphabet and then CIO. CIO is a chief investment officer. Okay. Mm. So you realize for the first time that maybe you were too old to be employed by somebody else. Yes, that's what I meant to say, that that I've realized for the first time that it may be that I'm um, too old to 
to be employed by someone else. And um, even as I may not feel that way, and in my business, age can also be a strength because it brings with it investing experience. But because of the break from the last position and then starting my own firm, there was just not the resume, which was, you know, gold golden leading up to that point was a little more checkered now. Uh, and almost immediately to um, convince someone and uh, to find employment was not as easy as I imagined it would be. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is, uh, what did you do with respect to the family? Of course, I shared this with you, uh, not directly with the kids as much. And uh, we brought a lot of our expenses down. Yeah. Right. Uh, we cut down on, um, you know, we stopped going to uh, expensive vacations, for example. We were never a big expensive vacation family, but even the more sort of um, mundane vacations, two or three that we would take a year. Um, and we made some other changes as well in our life on a day-to-day -day basis to preserve capital until things were improved. And then as luck would, not luck would, I shouldn't, I, I didn't mean to say, please uh, take that word back, not luck. As perseverance and effort would have it, um, your career took off and money started to flow in. And that gave me a lot of breathing room because, you know, that $25 example that you gave grew from $25 to $20,000 in just four years, which is an unprecedented uh, growth uh, that your perseverance and talent brought forward. So where one talent was taking a hit, another talent in the family um, proved good results and, and stabilized the situation. Well, something that but mom how, always talks yeah. something that mom always it. talks something that mom always talks about is that she felt like because she was a stay-at-home mom for over a decade that the most she went early in her career I remember late at night she would always say I feel like I owe dad the breathing room that he deserves that he's been carrying this monumental ship of our family for like 20 years on his back and it was always for her about how do I increase the margin day by day so that I can take the pressure off of him and so something that mom and I talk about a lot and something that we talked about this morning actually is it's almost as if you're obviously what happened this inflection point that you experience, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of in between that we're still settling. But I think one of the best things that came out of it was this like extreme hustle that mom brought to her business in a way that she focused on the numbers from day one. And I yeah. think that she didn't have any distractions because she had priorities that she had to fulfill. I don't see it that way. I mean, the hustle part notwithstanding, I meant the earlier comments that you made of you know, because even in the time that she was a stay-at-home mom, I just didn't do anything at home. I don't see do it that way that? either. I don't I mean, see it I, that way either. But she that's I how she felt. I was a very different human being leading up to this experience, right? I was extremely arrogant. Um, I did not ever do anything at home. Um, it only is in the last couple of years that I know how to use a dishwasher. Um, <laughs> I never, you know... <laughs> I never went into the kitchen. I never changed. I never did activities or brought you guys as kids. I mean, it was a very traditional Indian ma man. And, and I wish I was not that uh, traditional Indian man. And I was a more sort of involved parent that I am today because I've certainly enjoyed the last couple of years as a dad a lot more than I did 20 years leading up to it. Wait, so you you actually feel like you may have missed out a little bit? As a dad, yes. Because, yeah. you know, in trying to create that what I thought was a very fulfilling career. Actually, I don't know. I mean, if I if that career came back to me, maybe I'll go back to being that same person again. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that question. But I do oh. know that the last few years of having the time and, uh, for example, Veer, uh, one of the activities that comes to mind is uh, me bring, walking to Veer, walking Veer to school, which is only six or seven blocks each way uh, from where we live. But it was really satisfying because that was the only time he would have a conversation with me about what happened and what he did. And I feel like the 12-year-old Zoya and the 12-year-old Bridge, I have no memory of at all of what they did <laughs> at that age. And, uh, you know, I wish that was not the case. Okay, guys, this is dad's perspective. What was your guys' perspective when you found out that our family was going through financial stress? It was clear that we're going through financial stress. And we as parents never lied to you guys, right? We put it all out there. 
And there is a school of thought, especially in America, where people will say, don't tell the kids, don't don't burden the kids, like let the, don't let them know what's going on, just pretend it's all good. We obviously don't subscribe to that philosophy at all. Whatever happens, good or bad, you guys seem to know in real time. So how was it for you guys when you found out that dad's job and dad's career was going through all kinds of stress? And even though I'm making money now, even the transition from 25 to whatever was not like overnight. Yeah. It was a very, very long journey. In in Even though four years feels short in overall, but because we got hit with this right in the middle of my comedy journey, every day after his job ended was like a day of panic for me because I was like wanting to add money to an account that was not getting any money. So how yeah. was it for you guys to watch the two of us work it out? For me? I mean, yeah. I've, I've said this with you guys a bunch of times. I haven't really me, said it publicly. I know you've said it to me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I haven't really said it publicly ever just because you never had this conversation. But this experience, especially like the moment where we had a dinner and we were told everything, I think that that was the biggest blessing in disguise for me ever in my life. I think out of every single event that I've that's happened in my life, this was the one that I I treat with the most, like looking back on it, thinking that was the greatest thing that ever could have happened for me. For the family, I know it's not. I know how much stress that you and dad were under. But for me, this was like the biggest blessing ever. And I'll tell you why. Because before this happened, before I knew about this, I was the most bratty I don't care about any of you guys, like my family's good. Let me take an Uber everywhere, you know, type of kid where I would just spend money on anything. I didn't care. I there was I think for the first couple of years of my life, I really didn't even like look at price tags when I bought something. I never even like like now every time me, dad and Veer go out to get dinner at this point, it's just for fun. It's not even like we have to, but it's just for fun. We'll look at the price, compare it to other restaurants, say, does this make sense? You know, before this happened, I never would have thought that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really happy for this because it made me be more conscious about money. But two, it really made me mature. Like before that moment, I felt really immature. Looking back, I definitely was really immature. I got many detentions over the past couple of years before that. I got many disciplinary actions with my school and inside the building. Uh, I think that that moment really made me look at my own life and reflect and say that this is not, I don't want to be known as someone who just gets in trouble all the time and doesn't really do anything with their with their life and just you know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to be known as something else. I wanted to change the way that people looked at me in my life. Um, definitely. I felt that because now both of you guys were working because you went back to work and dad went back to work. Uh, dad was always working and you went back to like making money. And especially when in the start of an entrepreneurship, um, you don't have a lot of time with your family anymore because you're always working. You're always trying to grow the top line. And it takes a lot of time. But I had what a lot caused more. the change, Bridge? What caused the change? You you heard from us and we had a dinner. We sat down. We explained to you guys what was happening. What part of it resonated the most to you? Uh, I, I'm, what do you mean what part resonated the most like, to me? Wh- I, I, I know that the change happened because I've seen the change myself. But I myself am not sure what aspect of this journey hit you so hard in your heart that yeah. cause you to change your behavior. Okay, because well, you, you're kind of used to seeing mom and dad stressed out about money. I mean, that wasn't new, right? But the for difference you? was at this point was that both dad was going all day, you were gone all day, and then Didi had just left to college. So really, or was about to leave for college, but even in high school, she was really busy. As she went to a great high school and she was really busy all the time trying to get into Stanford and it happened because, you know, hard work pays off. So she was gone to college and really... For, and from the moment, when, whatever that was, 2021, 2022, to maybe 2023-ish, it was kind of just me and Veer. And I felt that I needed to take a lot of care of Veer. And I think that that's the mo- thing that really hit me in the heart was knowing that I I kind of felt responsible for taking care of Veer because we didn't have as much help. You got All three of you guys were gone and I was still in ninth, eighth grade going into ninth grade. So I was kind of young myself. So really especially with quarantine and everything, the only other person who could have took, the only person who could have taken care of Veer was me. So I felt that that moment, uh, that experience of taking care of Veer while managing everything else and learning what it means to be a big brother or learning what it means to be a role model, that's what really changed everything for me. Were you ever scared for yourself or for us as a family? I was definitely never scared for uh, my family. I was never scared for any of us because I know... I know mom, like I knew when you were getting to work, I think everyone in, the, in this family knew that you were going to be successful. So honestly, I really wasn't scared for that. 
I think there was a, some points where I would think, okay, everything's going to change. I still think that some days like we're going to move because, you know, different reasons, but I guess that's a little scary as moving for me is a little scary. But aside from that, I never felt that our family was just going to become so, we're just going to suffer so much that we're just not going to be able to come back from it. But there were days when you saw extreme stress between your dad and me. We used to, you know, we used to fight, not about the money per se, but things that were exploding because he was stressed out, I was stressed out. And yeah. why did you do this or whatever? Uh, you know, I remember those moments and I remember us being very open about all the fighting that happened in our family because what was the point of hiding? First of all, we live in a tiny apartment. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't know if you were being open with it or you were just shouting loud enough for everyone to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure where we're drawing the line here, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, Veer, what do you have to say about it? The time when we sat down, we had this conversation. Were you just like, I've got Bridge and Zoya and they'll take care of me? No, yeah. So I think I handled the situation wrongly, obviously, because I was younger than I am right now. So I don't really, I didn't really understand it fully. But I feel like I wasn't really focused on the right thing. As in when, I, when we were trying to cut money, the spending down, um, I was I was worried about um, cutting the cost of the wrong thing. I literally remember during quarantine, I was like, should I order this ice cream? Because I knew that it was an expense that we didn't need. But I really should have been thinking about like feeding myself because that would have been such a simple thing to stop do, um, to do that would have cut the cost down by so much because obviously auntie was great, but it would have just cut the cost down so much. But I was focused on the wrong thing. So I was more lenient on other people. I think you're being a little hard on yourself. I don't, yeah. I I think, don't I think anyone yeah. can want ice cream. We're, you were I think like what he's saying is that the help, household help, that was there to help feed him was a lot more expensive than the one ice cream that he wanted to order. And if he was just taking oh. control of himself and his ice cream and his feeding, we may not have needed that household help and saved a lot more money. Is that what you meant? That's what, that's what I mean. Yeah, okay, mm. I understand. Okay. And Zoya, how was it for you entering college, knowing that you're leaving, you're taking on this big, you know, big college tuition was coming up? And, you know, what were your feelings around the time? I felt a lot of guilt. I felt, Bridge described it really well in high school. I was really, really focused on school and focused on my extracurriculars. And I already felt like I was being really selfish in high school because I was so, every hour was, I was either tutoring or I was being tutored or I was on a sports team or I was in a club or I was studying for school or I was doing homework. Like there was not a single hour that I wasn't spending on myself. And I felt like, okay, it'll justify if I get into a place like Stanford, which I know is something that you guys really cared about. And that to me was enough motivation to be that selfish because I was like, if it pays off, then it pays off for our whole family. But what was really hard was leaving and feeling like we have this huge tuition that is meant to only serve me and to only give me the best four years of my life, quote unquote, right? And I felt like that couldn't be more of a selfish thing to pursue ever. Like my family is struggling, Bridge and Veer are worried about what ice cream they can and cannot order. Bridge is becoming some sort of like figure in Veer's life in a way that I can't be because I'm in California and they're in New York. And so I felt, I still feel so much guilt because it's, I, I just didn't, I, I, I had no idea. I was like, oh, this is a great college and it's on the West Coast and I'll get to experience this. But every day, and even to this day, I feel so selfish and I feel so much guilt that I can't be there every single day helping in the ways I want to. Right. And Shalab, for us, knowing that Zoya's entering college, the big tuition, of course, was, you know, in, in at a time when we're like trying to save all the money we can because he's an entrepreneur now. I am, have been for two, three years. It was very, very stressful. But we have, Shalab and I, I think we would both agree that we still try to proceed with courage, right? Even when the decision yeah, is because our Yeah, remember tough. what we always said for 20 years, right? That in, in this great country of ours, you cannot save yourself. 
into prosperity, right? You have no. to keep growing the top line. You have the to grow your top, the top line. If your yes. top line stops to grow, and this doesn't apply to the Walmart family or Jeff Bezos, but for most of the rest of the country, if they stop growing the top line, the top line will start to decline. And if the top line starts to decline and you start focusing on just cutting expenses, it'll only buy you time. It's only a matter of time after which you will find yourself into that same exact bankruptcy um, that you were going to find had you kept the expenses the same, just in that case, you would get there sooner. So, so hence, we were clarity, focused on top line. Hold on. For clarity, can you explain what the top line is for people who don't know what you're talking about? I mean, top line is just revenue that a family brings in, either through income right. or otherwise. Right. Um, so we were always very focused on growing the uh, the overall family income because if you can't see... You can only save a percentage of what you make, right? So if you're not mm -hmm. making a lot, all the savings in the world is not going to save our lifestyle, our kids, our home. So we became very aggressive about how to grow that big top line, the, the annualized family revenue, right? And in that case, even during a time when we were trying to save money, there's a constant conflict. How do you invest in things that will bring you revenue in the future, while you're still trying to save the money that you need right now in the present. That is an entrepreneur struggle. That is a struggle of a student. For example, when you are paying, uh, taking on debt, you're, you're investing in your future, but it was very hard for us to invest in our kid's future, for him to start a business, for me to start a business, to be worried about whether any and all of it will work. Um, yeah, it was a very stressful time. I For me, that, yeah. personally, it was a very stressful time. I have, I would say, a lot of resentment against the whole world about it. Not any one person, but I feel like I paid a huge motherhood penalty. I, you know, I paid a huge price for being a stay-at-home mom. And for many complicated reasons, I could not re-enter the workforce. For, 50, for 10 years of our life, it was just visa issues. You, I mean, to immigrate legally, there are a lot of restrictions on the visa that we came in because of which I couldn't work. Then was the issue of having little kids and who's going to take care of them. So I at least have had a lot of resentment on this topic. And then suddenly when it was my time to work, it became like, oh, my God, now we're in this new crisis phase, which is life, which is totally life. And I accept that. But I at least have a lot of resentment about it. But the good thing it did, it turned me into a total work machine. Every day that I go to work, I'm extremely focused on how am I making money for my family because I don't have time to faff around and drink and like just hang. <laughs> you never just hung Yeah, though. yeah. I mean, the two I don't think you around. ever hung. You've always, that's the thing that I think you don't see maybe, mom, is you always treated us as your kids even when you were a stay-at-home mom as if we were your business. No part of me felt like I was just being like pampered and like I was just being raised. And like, I feel like the way that you approached parenting is the exact same way you approach comedy. There was no fluff and there never is any fluff with the way that you operate. It was almost like, I felt like I was like an investment in myself. I think that's how, I mean, I don't want to speak for the boys, but like it, there puts a, it's not a bad pressure, but there puts this pressure to perform, right? When your parent is sacrificing so much, you and dad both combined down with working so hard to so have the So in that case, means. Zoya, where did we go wrong and why didn't you not perform? I have performed. What? <laughs> he, he's joking, he's joking. <laughs> well, I can speak for the boys because them and I have spoken extensively oh about this. Oh my God, this. you need to stop doing Dude, this. Dude, what are I you talking about? I don't like these subliminal shots, Aditi. Yeah, like, I don't know why I always get shots in the podcast. <laughs> but. Okay, Shalab, let's get into the meat of it quickly. What has been the worst part of all of this? I mean, I used to enjoy expensive shopping a lot. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and it can like I don't know why, but I really used to enjoy. Okay, really I, that's of, funny, but okay. what about the feeling that without thinking twice, you were the breadwinner? That feeling that your kids never had to think about whatever it is that they wanted within reason, of course. We're not the Gates family. I mean, yeah, or the like Bezos this is family. not a. I mean, like, that's kind of obvious, right? Obviously, that inability to just. Uh, the fact that V has to think about the ice cream he wants to buy is obviously very sad, right? It doesn't feel good um, to hear that. And, or, you know, 
that the kids have to worry about anything doesn't feel or good. Or bridge saying but I had to become time, almost a parent. Like bridge had to yeah. take charge. But, but at the I same have a time, question. Hmm. Do you still feel like me, Didi, and Veer respect you the same way we did before? Yes. I never thought that you respected me before, and I don't think you respect what? me now. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, the answer is yes. Okay. I always felt respected by everyone in the family. Least of your mother, least of it your mother, irrespective of circumstances. What, not least of it? Or what is the right way of doing it? Meaning... He, he thinks that you respect him the most. The most, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always been a mutual respect between us. Uh, and and I know that their dad has believed in my career since day one for years when I was yeah. putting money into it. He never said, why are you putting money into it? In fact, I would tell him, I'm putting family money in. It makes me so upset because it's hard earned money that now I'm putting in. I don't know if it's going to work. For Mom. a long time, we weren't sure. I also sure. knew that you're very conscientious with investments, right? You're not the kind of person who will who'll make... I mean, I knew you for multiple decades up to that point already. So I, it was not a, it was a calculated emotion to know that, you know, you yourself are not going to withdraw money beyond a point until you're absolutely sure of the return of it. Well, I wish your mom knew that I was conscientious because she seems to have no uh, understanding of it. I mean, she was always very supportive. I mean, she didn't think that you would make as good a comedian, I don't think, but she did have con you know, confidence that you will do a good job of whatever you did. Mom, okay, it, yeah, Vera, go ahead. When, um, when dad lost his job, <clears throat> yeah. like, what motivated you to become a comedian? No, I was already doing comedy when this happened. But I'm saying, what motivated you to put money into it? Because it would have just been easy to say, I'm going to motivate on my husband to do all the work and try you know, what, you know what I think? Can I, can I give an answer to this? Or not motivate, but something similar. What I think the big difference was before when you were doing comedy before this happened and what you when you were doing comedy after is that the de desire to have money was already at 100. But when after it became 110 and when it became 110, there was nothing else in your mind. You were allowing every idea. I remember when we were starting your TikTok, maybe before you would have thought about it more, but Instead of thinking about it, oh, what should I do this? Should we make this plan? You were just like, just do it. I don't care what 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 you want to do, just do it. And that like kill kill shot mindset of just do it, like no Nike reference, but just do it. That's what I think gave you the gave you the edge to become as successful as fast as you did. I I mean, I do think that it hit me. And I do like your dad talks about how he never worried about the money back then, right? Because he's like, I have money in the bank. I have the talent. People know I'm good. It's going to work itself out. I never saw it that way. I know that the world can be a cold, hard place. I know that at a certain age, employers are going to look at him and be like, we can hire two 20 year olds to do this job and they will work round the clock. Why do we need to hire this guy who's going to say, I need to go home at six o'clock? And as a woman, I know all the things that they can hold against you at a cert in, in certain ways. So I think I was very stressed out and I was trying. I mean, I know I passed all my stresses on to you guys because I was very open and vocal about my stresses. But I saw it much differently than your dad did from the outset. I, I didn't think it was going to be smooth and it has not been smooth and... That kill shot mentality that you talk about is what helped is, in my mind, I started saying to myself, I'm running a business and I'm answerable to my shareholders, which is this family of five. So I was no long, longer running my own thing. I was like, I need to justify if I'm leaving the five of you and not home for the weekend and not cooking and you guys are eating bananas for dinner or whatever things we had to do and we have to continue to do right now, I need to justify when I'm out of the house what it is that I'm doing and how is this additive to our family. For sure, it went to like steroid levels. Do you still of, feel that way? Yes. Abs Bridge, we're not out of the weeds right now. I'm I not mean, saying we are. I'm just wondering no, if that's No, rebuilding. Same... I mean, dad is back working. He's building his business. But we are very much in the weeds of this. And the truth is that in America, with three college tuitions, like just three college tuitions, a mortgage and healthcare, right there, it's enough responsibility to bury even the most conscientious human being. Honestly. 
it's a lot even just to say we have to keep this healthcare going our health insurance as two entrepreneurs it's a constant battle to keep that going wait do you still think that you need to justify what you're doing to me here and didi absolutely absolutely if i book anything i am like i but but what it has become is i've become ruthless in saying no do you know how many people reach out to me they're like we run this charity we run that charity come say but i'm like i cannot i cannot not spend time with my children and go out there save the children of the world <laughs> when i haven't seen you guys <laughs> i was there an entire weeks and weeks where i don't see you guys any of you how am i going to justify like i'm going to show up for this charity and that charity but i actually haven't put in any face time with my own kids i have no idea what you guys are eating drinking my 17 year old son has become like a parent to my 12 year old son my daughter is out there having an anxiety attack because she's feeling guilt and it's like i don't want to save anybody i need to first save my family and i feel extremely responsible wherever i am but the good part of this journey has been this i feel no shame in saying i'm sorry this job does not work for me does not serve me and i cannot do it because that's a trap women fall into all the time and i just don't even think twice because i think of you guys as my investors and i think i owe my investors i owe my shareholders the responsibility to do the right thing for them but also bridge in many ways you hold yourself for more responsible post this change right like you said it yourself that you felt really responsible for being a good role model and all these things so i would say in many ways all of us have hold, held ourselves more responsible for our time and the way we're spending it I think that yeah. that I I think that's actually a good thing, right? Like I think this is a really heavy topic and I think it's great that we're all talking about the truth and I think we're all being really honest. But I think one of the best things that's come out of this is I don't know what fluffy things we even do. I don't know what, you know, BS we even like there's nothing. I feel like we we are very like we're lean. And I think that's good. Yeah. What do you I mean? mean by we that? were never we were never the let's just take a vacation every yeah. three months family. we were always a family that was focused on work and business and education has always been the centerpiece so there's some of that but the the gravity around income has gone up dramatically and i actually feel good that your dad is saying that he didn't feel the pressure i actually feel good cuz i have been so nervous so many people in your dad's situation don't tell their families the truth they lie to their wives they lie to their kids because they don't want to deal with the shame surrounding it they don't want to deal with saying I, I, this i don't know how next year is going to be they want to always look like they have it under control and then what happens is that when you keep it all inside so much it explodes in other ways you, they start having an affair or they you know start having like all kinds of really severe mental situations where they don't know how to express themselves when you're hiding it for so long so i definitely feel that as a family we did something right where at least we can talk about it even though i have a lot of guilt for putting so much pressure on you guys at a very young age do you feel that pressure shala that you put a lot of stress yeah. on the kids yeah, yeah i do i do feel that because that pressure is clear i mean no 12 year old or 17 year old or even 21 year old should be worried about these matters because they have their entire life in front of us and i certainly did not at 21 or 20 or 19 you know i was in college and college was free and uh, everything looked up and up and i never had any we didn't have a lot so you know the price point to start point start with was very low but even so i don't remember thinking financial stress even for one day at that age most of my life at their age was spent about looking forward to better and better things So well look this has been like an interesting conversation there's there's many layers to it we can't get to all of it in one episode and it will come gradually we are also just as a family learning to talk about this believe it or not mm -hmm. it's not easy for us to talk about this we discussed went back and forth a hundred times should we do this episode it's so much easier to do an episode about your favorite movie 
it's so much easier but the lack of conversation surrounding this is a real problem especially in the brown community and we filmed this episode which is a little more on the heavier serious side in the interest of supporting all of you guys who want to go out there and talk about it to their family so thank you so much for watching listening we hope you like it you're going to subscribe follow give us your thoughts your feedback on this episode as we wrap up every episode with a segment called good grades with gargs i would like to know and then this segment we each garg assigns an a grade to another garg based on what that person brought into the episode today it could be entertainment it could be education it could be the moment of the episode according to them so guys uh, who wants to go first with assigning the the good grade a grade for today's episode okay zoya go i want to assign the a grade to dad i feel that dad was extremely honest and vulnerable about a topic where he could have so easily evaded or been dishonest or hid any facts and he could not have been more vulnerable and more raw and i think what was so beautiful to see was even when bridge and veer were describing their personal experiences they were also so vulnerable and so honest and i feel like that is a trait and a value that they have embodied as men and as sons because you have set that example and not all men are like that and i think that's really amazing and a testament to you as a dad okay but you you heard him when he said repeatedly like that his that his wife me was was Mom, open yes. and sharing and under yes, i just yes. i'm just making yeah, sure no, that you we we all God, agree bro okay all right who else wants I'll to go, go next. next okay bridge you go next okay i want i wanted to give the a grade to dad i assume everyone will, i want i'll give it to dad because i think that he answered the question of what he, if if he thinks that we still respect him he said yes which made me really happy to hear because someone in this family was telling me that he doesn't think that and i i'm just like happy to know that you do think that and the fact that you do think that means that you're confident you in that? yourself who it had to have who? been zoya who tells everyone everything in this family and goes I, and tells I, like if 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 lord drum came down from heaven and said that your mother <laughs> said that you should should not respect me i will not believe no not not that you shouldn't that you don't think we do oh no oh that my meant- god bridge the lies you tell i never why would i ever say that You you This say that a, all the time. What I never said. I said you have to always be respectful. Okay. I'm always reminding Whatever. the kids Whatever. This that is, this you should always track. be respectful. Okay. Oh my god! I'm not you saying that you should. You said that we shouldn't be respectful. <laughs> Bridge, you just. This is why you don't. You don't even. <laughs> okay. Oh okay. I, okay. So yeah, you know so much, Bridge. This is why you don't even whatever. Okay. All right, okay, but next. it is good to know that he yeah. feels respected. It, that I agree. Good. Okay. All right. Who go, who wants to go next? Veer. Okay. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I think Dad obviously deserves it, but I'm just trying to make the episode feel different. So I'll just give it to Mom because I feel like she was asking all the questions that made the episode feel productive. I guess would be the right word. And yeah, she was just asking all the good questions. So so wait do is it deserved or it feels like some sort of charity a grade which in which case i reject it if it is not an honest a grade What i don't want it charity? i don't want a pity a grade i don't accept that why because you you you, you, grade, you always you take this one that <laughs> yeah, that is your little mom like what is that supposed to mean no cuz i already said dad obviously deserves it because this is like his episode but I'm just trying oh. to make it feel different. Okay, mom, who is your A grade okay, going to? Okay, hold on. No, dad wants to go next, so I'll go next. Who wants to? I don't I'll go next. My A grade goes to all three of my kids. Look, they um and this they did not do in this podcast, but in December when we were at lunch at um Serafina, which became like our extended kitchen almost in that period <laughs> in the holidays. Uh all three of them at lunch said unprovoked They almost prefer me this way, which felt very nice. We do, a hundred percent. Not almost. Close. We prefer. Not even close. That felt very nice to hear. Uh, of course, your dad had to steal my idea because I had, upon a walk recently, told him that one of the times we will, I will assign the A grade to all three kids because they're so understanding. 
of our family circumstances and he took it and he ran with it <laughs> before I could say anything. No this way. is what <laughs> a family of liars, a family oh, of oh cheats, a family of thieves. <laughs> Instead of saying this was your mom's idea, he goes, oh, let me just before no, oh, I'm ready. Let me go. <laughs> so anyway, I do think that your dad deserves the A grade today because even in the best of circumstances, talking about money for a brown man, for a dad, for the breadwinner is very, very difficult and complicated. And to let alone do it on a podcast with a camera and all of it, knowing that millions of people are going to watch it, including his mother and her whole family. And uh, it's just, I no, really... Mother I, is generally very understanding, you know. Uh, we will decide how understanding, let me speak to that. Uh, I think that you deserve the highest praise for for not only being honest and not only being uh, an emotionally stable, mature person, but also for supporting your wife to this extent. Because this entire podcast came about because I wanted to create another dimension of something to serve to my audience. And then all of you started rallying around in such a big way. And I'm very deeply honored. And before my mother-in-law comments on this and says, this emotionally stable man, I raised him. I will remind people that he has lived with me more years than he has lived with his mother. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We want to hear what you think. We want to hear uh, your A grade for us. And we want to hear how it's going in your family. Please reach out to us on all platforms. Comment below and uh, like, subscribe and share for another family that you think would benefit from hearing this. Thank you so much. Everybody say bye to the audience. Bye. 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 bye.